it's it's a great joy to say that we have Michaela Cole with us from London right now to talk about it. How are you? I'm doing okay, Tom, day by day. Thanks for having me. It's a lovely to have you. It's, in, most of the time when I would speak to someone with the success that you're experiencing right now, I would speak to them after the fact and I would go, what was it like back then? But I have the rare opportunity to ask you now, as someone who's like, uh, his face and name is all over Twitter. I was on BuzzFeed this morning and you were the top story. Like, how are you? Oh, wow. Uh, how are you holding up with it? Oh, well, I don't use Twitter much. God love and you. I'm not on Instagram. Yeah. So the, the, there's something that feels strangely normal right now. Um, there was a, 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 a very striking piece by Alex Jung in the New York magazine that did make me begin to process a little bit what was going on. And um, the magnitude of it all is really quite overwhelming. So I'm taking it day by day. Uh, I bought a plant. So I've been watering a plant. Is that a a therapeutic success plant? Just something really normal to do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm getting into puzzles, you know, I'm doing a puzzle at the moment, <laughs> it just feels normal. I'm glad, I'm glad you're doing a couple of puzzles anyway. I was, I was hoping we could talk about your character here. Um, at mm. the start of I May Destroy You, we're introduced to a young black British woman named Arabella, an emerging author, laboring through her second book. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about her. Yeah, I think she's uh, strong and vulnerable and very smart and incredibly naive, um, strong-willed but faltering, confident and insecure. I think uh, she holds in her many, uh, many juxtapositions that many of us can relate to. I, I, you know, only talk about this as much as you want, but early in the show, Arabella is the victim or, or survivor, I should say, of, of what she later understands as a sexual assault. And throughout the series, we watch her struggling to piece together the facts and implication of that event. And I know that this is a work of fiction, but you've said that it's based on a sexual assault that you survived as well. Um, how did you decide to take the thing and, and turn it into this thing? Yes, the beginning of the story, mainly episodes one and two, are very much inspired by my own real life experiences. Um, and they play out in a very similar way to Arabella's. I was working, doing an all-nighter in a production office I met up with a friend uh, taking a break to have a drink and my drink was spiked and I had a flashback a few hours later. So very, very, very similar. When did I decide to write this into a work of fiction? There wasn't really a moment. I think for me, I write uh, A, to disassociate from something very painful, but B, to get closer to it. Like it's the only way I can find a way to try to understand it. So very quickly, when I was uh, in the police investigation room, a little bit like Arabella in episode two, um, I recall waiting uh, for the detective to give my first witness statement. And at that moment where I was sort of half processing that something very bad had happened to me and that the course of my life was about to shift, I looked at my friend who was uh, taking care of me and he was playing Pokemon Go on his phone. And this <laughs> was, was just so absurd <laughs> that I thought, what on earth is going on? And I wrote that down. I wrote it down in my notes app on my phone because it was so, um, you almost want to bottle this very strange um, feeling and this sort of um absurdity that was happening. So that was the beginning. And I would uh, take little notes. I would record conversations with the detectives on my phone. I would uh, record feelings and thoughts into my phone and write things down. And I think I'm trying to document so that I don't forget what's going on so that I can't disassociate. And naturally, if I'm already writing it and taking notes, I'm uh, eventually going to begin developing that into a story. I'm always um, writing from some place of of reality but of course then mm. uh, once my friends knew I was writing a show they began to share their experiences with me mm. and I began to realize that sexual assault um, was something so broad and something that so many people could identify with mm. which in one way is heartbreaking but in another way what better basis to give a story to the world than on one we can all identify with and and this was it. It's, it's interesting to see the the reaction to that, you know, in a lot of the reviews and, and, and 
quite wonderful reviews of, of the work. You know, what's pointed out is that Arabella does party. Arabella does, you know, do drugs recreationally. You know, she she's outward about sex. None of this is ever, as, as, as is pointed out in these reviews, none of this is ever used to justify uh, what, what happened to her. Um, how, how much of that was on your mind? I definitely wanted to create a character that was human and that um, I, I didn't want to justify. I just wanted her to be a human living and something bad happens, you know? Yeah, there's, a, there's, there's a, something happens. I think we, we, we dehumanize people and they become part of a story, you know, like a, a, a narrative yes. that we have in our minds of of a yes. news a news story as opposed to my god this person has a family and this person has friends who play pokemon go and this person has had good days and bad days you know yes i think that's actually it's a really good way of putting it um we dehumanize everybody we dehumanize the victim we dehumanize the criminal and when we dehumanize um the victim and just constantly shelter and protect them and keep them away from all harm you're actually keeping often, for me, I found uh, we were keeping Arabella away from growing and the amount of protection was blinding me to understanding the, the, the true complexity of the world of sexual assault of criminals and victims and that dehumanization, that flattening of a life can mean that our perception of the world is also flattened and then we're not seeing things properly. And this has, you know, certainly for Arabella, catastrophic consequences. And that, that dehumanization comes, I think, with a, a lack of empathy. And I think that, uh, but I think that empathy is hard sometimes. You know, you, uh, I like you was raised in the church. I know you came to the church a bit later, but I like you was, was raised in the church. And, you know, empathy was in, in my particular way, way I was brought up was, was a really, really big part of that. But then I, I grew up and I started to question it as well of whether everybody deserves empathy. It's a very, it's a very strange uh, time to be talking about empathy right now because sometimes you feel, you, you meet people and you see people, you, you, you feel sort of, um, how do I put this, upset about understanding them at all. You know, like um, you feel sort of betraying something socially within you to, to understand them. You know, I, I, could, I could see the empathy in your work here. Yeah, definitely. I think it is scary to empathize. And something that I'm definitely engaging with as a writer is, is I'm, I'm trying to call for the individual. So not when you're in your tribe. This isn't about community think and community action. Mm. This is about you as an individual and how you sleep and how you choose to see things. Because there are huge... Um, systematic traumas that are happening but there's also you as an individual and I think it's empowering to have empathy I am not asking people to have empathy in order to save help cure or comfort the other person from a purely self from from purely self-interest daring to have empathy is incredibly powerful it will help you sleep better mm. if you try to understand the other person. How, how did you um, approach telling the stories of your friends that they were sharing with you, or telling stories that were inspired by the friends? I mean, what a what a responsibility and what a pressure that must be. Yes, well, uh, the the very you know, a some are are definitely fictional, but the ones that were very much lifted from reality, I would say I'm going to record now, and you tell me what happened so that I write it. So it was all very clear. Um, and it's, it, it, it did feel like a big responsibility, which is why I would allow them to read the scripts as I went, because I was very conscious of, of how I could honor their story, whilst also being very mindful of the fact that the story is for the world and the story is something that I want the audience to resonate with as much as the individuals who gave me their stories. So it, it was really quite a quite a challenge and I, I had to try to be mindful of that and uh, you know they were brought on as consultants and uh, credited and, and paid where they wanted to be and uh, it, it was a real it was a real challenge these things aren't easy 
You know, the thing that's sticking out in my mind about everything you've said so far is, is the reality. The word reality keeps on coming up over and over again. And I saw uh, some questions about, you know, how can this show, which is presumably about someone who has experienced a great trauma, be funny? And I thought to myself, well, when we experience trauma, when we experience grief, when we experience violence, we still have funny things that happen in our in our days. So I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about, you know, that that's in this show, you know, that there's there, that there's humor in the show. Yes, and it, it certainly goes back to that um, time in the um, police investigation room that I mentioned before of th- th- that tone of feeling like my world was ending while my friend who was being my rock was also playing Pokemon Go. This is weird because it's funny. It's weird. And that was the tone that basically never left um, me as I began to write the scripts. It was like a, a, a friend in the corner who was uninvited to a party, but showed up anyway with gags in their bag and would just it, be there. And it, it wasn't um, intentional. There was no way to uh, make it funnier or less funny. There was just a tone. And it really began with that moment. It was the Pokemon Go while my <laughs> life was ending. <laughs> Um, I, I went, and the, on the way in, I told you that you were uh, a number one on on BuzzFeed, and you sort of were surprised or reared back. I don't, I mean, you hadn't you hadn't heard. I should I should tell you what it was about. You know, the, you're the number one story on BuzzFeed because of the story came out about you walking away from a million dollar deal with Netflix over the ownership of this show. I may destroy you, and it was like, you know, what can we learn about our self worth from that decision? I, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, what can we learn? What what did I learn? You I, did, you did walk away from it, though. You did walk away from it. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and and the, I think it was hard because it it, def, it definitely is not me saying I know my self worth because I went far enough down with that deal that I had a contract in my hand, and so I came that close to signing it. So I didn't quite know my worth with this project for a long time. I also do think that sometimes. There is no need to keep your rights, I'm sure. But for me, this show was about um, somebody being exploited, somebody being disempowered, uh, how deception can occur. So it seemed at complete odds with the show I was making that I was asked to direct, write, star, create, and yet would have no rights. Writing a show about exploitation, it didn't seem to gel these two things um, together. So between that decision, having an intimacy coordinator on set, therapists on set, um, a a very diverse behind the scenes, did making this series give you a vision of what the industry could potentially look like, your industry could potentially look like? Could potentially look like, and in a way, um, already does, because it happened on my show. I I am so lucky to have... uh, found the most incredible co-exec producers. Um, Phil Clark is somebody that I worked with on Chewing Gum. He was the head of comedy at Channel 4 whilst I was there. And I had remembered how much he saw the potential in my early drafts more than anybody. When when everybody thought I was writing um, incoherent babble, Phil was somehow able to make sense of what I was writing. So I knew to pursue him and to find him. So I was very lucky that I managed to assemble a team of people who are very mindful. I think also peers at the the BBC. um, I was shooting Black Earth Rising at the time when I walked away from the Netflix deal. And he knew that I was feeling a little bit conflicted and I had a lot of mistrust for the industry. So was really ready to step up and and dare to give me um, what I needed to feel like I was in complete creative control. So this allows me to know that it can happen because it has happened. It can happen. How do you think you've been changed as a person from when you first went out? I should point out to to people listening to this, you you sort of go out into the wilderness or you sort of go out all on your own to to write uh, all by yourself in sort of a... um, a desolate area, which I really do, I am sort of uh, envious of as I spend time in a city during a pandemic, by the way. Yeah, I mean, me too. I'm in the city during the pandemic as well. And boy, oh boy, do I miss being uh, being in the quote unquote wilderness. What it does for me is that you, you may be jealous, but it's, it's a terrifying experience. Mm. It's really scary because mm. in some places there really is no one there. I've, I've stayed in places where if I screamed, 
no people hear me. Where the only other house I see is on a hill far away and it's like this small because it's that far away. But I need that terror. Why? 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 <laughs> because, yes, because um, I, I realized that the only thing I could possibly be afraid of is myself. So then it makes me confront the parts of myself that I'm a little bit scared of. And often those are things like my, my flaws, the parts of myself that I don't want to deal with, that I don't want to face, my capacity to be a horrible person, to um, treat other people poorly. I have to engage with all these parts of myself um, whilst I write these characters. And I don't really know why I have to do that, but I have to do that. Um, and I have to discover those parts of myself, then love those parts of myself because I'm about to write characters that might not do um, always heroic things, characters that do really horrible things. And I have to find uh, the part of me that is able to love those parts. And if all these characters are coming from my mind, uh, I have to find some sort of way of, of, of having, as you um, introduced to our conversation, empathy. Do you... Um... Do you feel a different from who you were when you started writing this show? Uh, in many ways, but in many ways, I'm exactly the same. It's well, interesting. It is. Uh, it's been such a joy to talk to you. I think that, um, I, I don't think I see, I've seen a show that, that uh, deals with so many real uh, and traumatic things, but uh, I, I felt such a, a sense of kindness throughout it. Mm. And, um, thank you, and thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. It's been lovely.